Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to invite you to come on in and get settled while I share just a few thoughts before we start the presentation at the top of the hour. Uh, I wanted to let you know that our last webinars were back on January 3rd and the 17th, and we had David Crow with us, and he gave a two-part presentation covering the safe use of essential oils as well as the important essential oils for a home pharmacy. It was just a terrific presentation. You know, I've been using essential oils for so many years and studying them and, and not only was I so excited about David's presentation being offered as a live video um, as well as his presentation style, but he's such an excellent teacher. So I really hope you check them out. I learned so much. I can just say they're full of very terrific information. Additionally, if you're not aware, I wanted to, to be of our All About Alumni series. It's a 30-minute live online event, and it showcases Hawthorne graduates. And they have the opportunity to share their successes and the challenges that they've learned from post-graduation. So I think it's a great opportunity for you to tune in with us live because you can talk to the grads and ask them questions directly. And I think that has a lot of value. These presentations air at noon Pacific time on the first Wednesday of each month. So you can tune in with us on next. Our next one is Wednesday, April 5th at noon Pacific daylight time. And you can hear our graduate Vicki Stein, who's um, a graduate of our doctoral program, and she'll share about her journey. She'll be the first graduate from our doctoral program to be um, a presenter here. So it might be a very interesting for those of you that are considering advancing from your uh, master's degree and going on and see what she learned while she was in school and how it's serving her now. And as usual, we record all of our webinars and our All About Alumni live events, and we'll record this one today as well. And you'll be able to access them from our website anytime, and you'll find them under archived webinars. And um, last thing here is, you know, we're going to have a survey for you to complete after the webinar. It's a short questionnaire, and it's an opportunity for you to give us feedback on this presentation, but also to let us know what you'd like to learn about more in upcoming webinars. Um, that's important to me. I pay attention to this. This service is for you, and we want to be able to bring content to you that really serve your needs and interests. So speak up, and I'll pay attention. I think that's it. We're going to go live here in just a couple of minutes, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm excited about this presentation. We've got a change in seasons. We, we have spring equinox yesterday where we were equal time day and night everywhere on the globe where the sun rising in the east and the setting in the west equidistant so it was a magical day and really a potent time as we shift from winter to spring as I say that as we just got pounding thunder and lightning and, and hail falling at the moment and so <laughs> it's, it's still a season shift. So we'll see what our presenter, um, Dr. Bianca Grayley, has to say with us about that season change. So I'm going to switch gears here from just blabbing about these things and start introducing um, the, the webinar for today. So for everybody that's still continuing to join in, I want to welcome you to Hawthorne University's webinar series and thank you for joining in. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and it's always my pleasure to be the moderator and to um, join with you together in this presentation for today. I want to let you know we'll save time for your questions at the end of these presentations. So at any time, just add your questions and your comments to the webinar panel, and I'll pose them for each of you at the end of the presentation. And today, Hawthorne welcomes our esteemed faculty member, Dr. Bianca Grilli, and she's going to be sharing Nature, the Ultimate Gene Whisperer. And those of us that are here likely realize that easing seasonally is a cornerstone of holistic nutrition, right? And so this webinar is going to delve deeper into the relationship between the changing seasons as well as the impact on our genetic expression. We'll be discussing how these cir circannual rhythms of the body play an integral part in our food choices and thus our health outcomes. I think this is so critical because what we're understanding now is that a full quarter of the human genome changes the way it's expressed based on the season and when our weather 
changes and for the time of the year. And because plants go through a very similar change, highlighting the importance of understanding the various energetics associated with plant foods and how this corresponds to the needs of the human body. Uh, Dr. Grilly is going to present common health conditions and how the seasonal eating can be more effectively applied in these scenarios. So when we combine the ancient knowledge of the rhythmic changes of nature, humans and plants, with 21st century research on clock genes and genomic expression, we find that it will generate the potential for creating even more personalized and effective healthless, um, holistic wellness holistic wellness programs, which is what we're all trying to do here as educators and clinicians in, in practice and training and post-graduation from Hawthorne. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Grilly. It's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating lead how she got to us at Hawthorne. She was a U.S. Marine and turned naturopathic doctor. She received her undergraduate degree in biology and then her doctorate degree in natural Pathic medicine, graduating from Bastyr University. And Dr. Grilly currently runs a lifestyle medicine practice and a consulting business in Northern California. So in addition to working with the patients to create personalized lifestyle medicine programs, she also consults with medical practices around the country and with nutraceutical companies in a variety of professional educational capacities. So we're very grateful that she's on the faculty of Hawthorne University and proud that she's current president and founding board member of the California cha chapter of the Children's Heart Foundation. Um, Dr. Grilly, I hope that you present on, on this work that you're doing and the issues with children's um, hearts <laughs> coming up in the future too. That sounds fabulous. And I love it that you live in beautiful Northern California with me as well. Well, not with me, but in, in California. Um, well, I'll come have, visit, Paula, anytime. <laughs> okay, I'll put that out. That, <laughs> that, that invitation's on the table anytime. Um, yeah, two active children and four backyard children. Chickens, do you still only have four chickens? Because it's spring, you know. <laughs> we do. No rooster. So, you know, we'll have to just be happy with the four we have for now. But... But um, they're, they're laying well, so we're, we're happy about that. Fabulous. Love it. All right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bianca, and let you take it from here. I know you have some terrific information to present. I'm very excited about this gorgeous slideshow that you've put together. So it's up to you now. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you to the Hawthorne community for allowing me to present on this. This has been a topic that has been um, something I've wanted to expand on for quite some time now, but without the um, maybe the avenue to do so, I was a, a little bit at loss of how to bring some of this information forward. And so, Paula, when you and I talked about another webinar, I jumped on top of the fact that maybe I could do it on this particular topic. So it's been really wonderful, as I was explaining to you earlier, in moving into the literature rather than just understanding how nature is um, speaking to us, if you will, and how we respond to nature, instead of just understanding that from an intuitive perspective, once I started to go into the very large body of literature on this topic, um, it was just thrilling to see how much of what we, again, intuitively understand on so many levels is actually being played out. Um, in research laboratories across the world. So what I'm hoping to do today is to bring some of this information together so that as we move forward with whether we're doing education or therapeutics with our, our patients and our clients, that we can bring some of the older, intuitive, uh, cultural practices into real-time uh, medicine as we um, work it into our practices um, on a daily basis. So we're going to start with a title, which is Nature is the Ultimate Gene Whisperer. Long before seasonal eating became, you know, one of Hollywood's flagship dietary trends, seasonal eating was actually an everyday cultural experience. And it's been taking place for generation after generation. And it followed this seasonal pattern. And the seasonal pattern um, was based on when the sun was was available and when the rain was available, what were their resources within their environment? When were droughts happening at a particular time of year or um, over a decade long um, time frame or when were floods happening? 
when was it hotter, when was it colder, when was it windy, when was it calmer. All of these factors came into play in some of our more traditional cultural practices of eating, of medicine, of agriculture, and just in cultural practices in general. The traditional cultures didn't just look at the environment either. They also looked at their resources <clears throat> and the necessities and the cycles of the human body. What did we need at different times of the year? What did the seeds or the plants or the animals that were, we were in relationship need during different seasons of the year? And so I think with bringing all of the um, observation that people had within their natural environment, bringing it to play into an actual system of living is what they did. And so today we're going to go through some of those things and learn how our genes actually respond to the language of nature. Um, it helps us to have appropriately timed food sources that then speak to our genes to produce the appropriate types of proteins and building plot blocks that actually code for our health and our wellness. And so, for example, as we'll talk about more later today, there are fall and winter foods that we eat, again, from a cultural perspective or from a seasonal perspective that actually trigger different signals to happen within our genome that change our chemistry, our biochemistry of the body, to then be able to withstand the rigors of an upcoming winter. And vice versa, when we eat the spring and summer foods, the messages that those send to us is actual instruction for which proteins to um, express and which ones not to express in relationship to the upcoming seasonal change. So I think it's really fascinating, again, that from a uh, Western perspective, we talk about seasonal eating, but do we really know why we're talking about it and what is happening underneath? And I think that's where the magic happens as practitioners. If we really understand the uh, purpose of eating seasonally beyond just that there's more nutrients, which we all know that's true, um, how does that provide the appropriate energetics and mechanisms to support an optimal uh, healthy body and a well mind? I love, I, I think I probably put this particular slide in every presentation I've done since I found it because it's so profound. So in Nature Communications in May of 2015, a study came out and um, they had looked at over 22,000 genes and they found that nearly a quarter of those genes, 23%, uh, were identified as having seasonal variation in expression. And that got me so excited and I think that was my segue into thinking about how we eat and what it's doing with our genes from a seasonal perspective. Now within this study there's a graph and again I think this is really um, uh, eye-opening to see it in this perspective in which our summer genes on this graph which are um, colored in blue you can see there's a down regulation of them during the winter months and an up regulation during the summer months. And then when you look at the green ones, which have been um, labeled as the winter genes, you see those being more highly expressed during the winter season or the cold season and then um, less so in the summer. Uh, there's a couple more graphs in this particular study. I would highly recommend that you take a look at it. Um, the information for your references on the bottom of this slide. But a couple other slides will actually show you that when they studied the gen genetics in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, that these graphs were actually inverse. So they, our genes will change expression based on not necessarily if it's fall or winter months, but the actual temperatures of where we're living at that time. So Paula, you and I had briefly talked about how you're still feeling the effects of your travel and your genes. And I was saying, I think you're right. It actually probably did change your genetics while you were traveling. Um, not so that it changed your genetics, but it changed the expression of your genetics. And I think, again, that this is just a very relevant study for so many reasons. So definitely bookmark it. Show it to your clients. Show it to your family. Um, it really helps us to understand that we are part of nature and we respond to nature and the seasonal changes. So with that being said, as a kind of an introduction, 
I want to tell you the purpose of today's webinar, give you a little bit of a layout of how I'd like to um, present it, and then we'll summarize at the end because a lot of the information that's going to come up will, may seem a little piecemeal, but I'd like to bring it together in a comprehensive summary at the end so that you can hopefully track what I was trying to uh, get to in terms of the point of the story of this webinar. So initially, we're going to review a couple of traditional seasonal health systems, which most of you will probably be familiar with. We'll delve a little bit into TCM and Ayurveda medicine. And then we're going to talk about the more scientific and more uh, current research that talks to us about clock genes and the cyclical patterns that they are elucidating in research and in the science and on the bench in living systems. We'll explore uh, the quickly growing areas of epigenetics and nutrigenomics. And then we'll take a little glimpse into the seasonal fluctuations that we experience as human beings in both our health and our disease processes. And then finally, we'll wrap it up again, hopefully to summarize a little bit of how we might be able to utilize this information either in our families, for ourselves, or in our practices as we approach, again, both a healthful um, living aspect as well as disease processes, both in prevention and um, uh, therapeutics. So before we jump into there, uh, as Paula was saying, a little bit about my background and, and maybe why I did come into this particular topic um, is, is because of how I grew up. So grow, I grew up in my teenage years on a farm in Iowa, and at the time, uh, it, I was not very excited about it. Growing up on a farm um, at 13 and 14 when I'd never been exposed to it was not something that I had ever thought I would do. But hindsight, it was such a tremendous learning opportunity and really laid the foundation for virtually everything I did afterwards as an adult. Um, some of these pictures here can show you kind of the, some of the cycles that we went through from a seasonal perspective, both on our farm that we had in Iowa, but also present day. So on the left-hand side, on the top um, picture, you'll see a pantry full of beautiful canned pears, and green beans on, the, on the, the bottom shelves as well as some, it looks like I think to be cherries and raspberries on the, on the right side. And this is my mother's pantry <clears throat> just a couple of weeks ago. She sent me a really nice um, uh, photo of it so that I could use it on this webinar. But this is the way our pantry looked when I was growing up and it was just chock full of jars that we had preserved from our own, um, our, our own farm or what we could uh, acquire at other people's um, locations who might be um, growing something else that we weren't growing. On the bottom right, there is a, another picture of canned, beautiful canned goods. These are pears and, and peaches as well. And this is from my uncle's pantry who lives in Utah, and he continues the tradition also. So you can see once it's in your blood and once it's in your, your daily and annual routine, it just becomes a part of your nature. And that's one of the things that I want to really bring out during this webinar is that we might think that we don't know this information, uh, but at a genetic level and an, and an intuitive level, we do know that the seasons are changing and we do feel it. It's a matter, again, of remembering it. Um, and then educating ourselves and others on it so that we can continue to live in these cycles and these seasonalities. Bottom left-hand corner is um, some food and, and produce that we got from our garden a couple of years ago. I think this was um, an, a late fall harvest, maybe 2015. And uh, my, my kiddos helped me grow it, and we, we had such a wonderful time doing it. And you can see the fruit of your labors. It's so beautiful when it happens. And this, so this was a fall picture. In the middle, we have our um, late summer picture. And then in the upper right-hand corner, we had our plums from the uh, spring and summertime. So again, you can see that it's even though you may not grow up in it, and most of us don't anymore, it is within us. And so the more we can become in tune with understanding what happens in each season, again, both through education as well as experience and actually getting out there and experiencing it, the more we will hear the message that is coming from our genes. So we're going to jump right into a couple of those traditional seasonal health systems that I talked about previously. And the first, again, most of you have probably either worked with this particular seasonal health system or health system in general, or at least are aware of it. But traditional Chinese medicine uses a five-element framework. It's a very ancient system that is um, it's basically woven into the fabric of the Chinese culture. 
And uh, a lot of their theory is the foundation not only for their their diet and their lifestyle, but even some of their disciplines such as the feng shui and, and their martial arts. The TCM is a template that has brought in, brought in, as we spoke about previously, all of these different elements from nature. And so they, they've created this system that organizes nature into different categories or groups or patterns. Um, and each of these five groups are governed by a different element, whether it's wood, fire, earth, metal, or water. And within those elements, they are also coordinated with different directions, climates, stages of growth and development, um, internal organs, body parts, and energies and tastes, and also what we're going to be talking a lot about today, the seasons. There's a lot of pictures, a lot of resources for learning more about this type of medicine. One of the ones that I've um, found particularly helpful for me is a book called Healing with Whole Foods. Asian Traditions and Modern Nutrition by Paul Pitchford. Um, I'd highly recommend that book if you um, have a desire to learn more about TCM, particularly about their nutrition. Now, what I wanted to do over these next couple of slides is take you a little bit deeper into the TCM uh, approach, not just to nutrition, because we have to remember this is not just a nutritional or a health system. This is a life system. And so when, when the ancient Chinese followed this system, they basically were preventing disease and optimizing wellness. And so it's really, uh, to me, so cool to see how they brought all these pieces together and that this is still relevant today. Uh, once you start to get the feel or the energetic for these different seasonal pieces and characteristics, it really does become second nature and I wish you could see my hands because they're all over the place and I'm not Italian and yet you just feel it. You can feel when you talk about spring that these really are new beginnings and in a Western perspective we start talking about cleansing and detoxification and when we look at the Chinese uh, system of medicine it, they also are talking about cleansing. So the organs of the body that are associated with, uh, with spring and TCM are the liver and the gallbladder. And of course, these are our, two of our primary areas that support cleansing and detoxification pathways. They also recommend rising early with the sun. Again, that makes so much sense if we're thinking about how the seasons affect our genetics and our, our um, health because in the spring, we do have more sunshine and the sun does rise earlier. So we're lifting up, we're ascending, we're coming, we're rising, our energy is coming up. If you think about the asparagus, it starts to pop, and that's one of your spring vegetables, right? It starts to pop its little head up, sometimes even through the snow, as it feels the lengthening of the days. And so again, in TCM, they recommend increasing that energy as we pull the energy up from, from the earth and up through the plants, or if you're thinking about the body, we're bringing energy up from our feet and upwards into our, our um, upwards and out in, uh, through our through our heads. So uh, ascending again, it's act, it's uh, it's a more active time of the year and of our bodies, and we start thinking of this spring fever, and that's exactly what happens, I think, to as many of us as we start to see these lengthening of the days and the warmer uh, weather. Um, this this particular time of the season nurtures the yang component of TCM which starts to really show up during the summer months. So again, now we're nurturing those genes that are getting ready, getting us ready for the warmer and hotter months of summer. The um, tastes associated with spring are bitter and sour and again if we think of some of the foods that we would, we would associate with spring, that's exactly what we're experiencing. So we've got our nice, tender, young greens. We've got our sprouts. We have our peas that are coming up and maybe even some spring potatoes or early potatoes. Um, and then we want to really start to limit the heavier foods that were actually very good for us during the winter months. And we're going to come full circle into that in a few seconds here. 
If we look at the summer, now this is a time for growth. And so when you look at the plants, you see that instead of now going upwards as they did in the spring, they start to go horizontally. They start to bring out their leaves and the leaves open up and they've got this nice luxurious opening to bring in the sun into all of their cells for their cell growth and for their genetic expression. We're really looking to eat more of those brightly colored fruits and vegetables. And now with all of this energy associated with summer, we're looking for foods that are going to help cool us down. And so now we're thinking about those cucumbers that are coming out that have more of those cooling properties. So thinking about what is really being grown in summer and how that's supporting our, our actual health, overall health during those particular times of the year. Autumn, on the other hand, is now when we're starting to gather in. So now we're not just gathering in the fruits of our summer harvest but we're also gathering in ourselves and our energy. We're starting to bring it a little bit closer. We're organizing things. We're getting ready for that long season of colder weather. We might cook our foods a little bit longer. And we're starting to eat a little bit less from, from the, um, the greenish component of the new growth. And we're starting to get a little bit more uh, dense in our foods. We've got now our zucchinis and we've got our tomatoes and maybe some of our melons that might be a little bit later in their season, but we're preparing for the yin component now. So we just had our yang during the summer, waning in the autumn, and starting to bring in that yin component that's the downward energy cycle. And then finally, we get into our winter months where we really do turn inward. And so from a plant perspective, everything dies down and it brings its energy back down into the tubers and down into the root system. And the leaves go away and that upward energy that we saw in the spring is gone and we brought it back down into the, the very earth itself. From a human and a, um, a, a body perspective, we're doing the same thing. We're bringing all of our energy inward and we're slowing down. We might see some weight gain, and is it problematic if we're eating the right foods? Probably not. We're, we're getting ready a little bit for that hibernation component that so many of, of, the, our other, of the other animals do um, in our environment. Here is where we would start bringing in things that are going to nurture and keep us warm and keep us um, safe, if you will, and solid uh, down foundation into the earth. And we're looking at dried foods and beans and winter greens. And here's where you add a little bit more of those salty and bitter flavors. Now, again, this is a seasonal living system from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, but it really does incorporate so many of the principles that, again, intuitively make so much sense and that we will see later in this uh, presentation are being uh, validated through scientific research. Another seasonal health system uh, that has been around for thousands of years is Ayurveda. And Ayo means life and Veda means the knowledge of. And so if you look at this from its definition, it's actually the knowledge of life. And so again, I'm not going to go into details on this one. We did that with the TCM. Instead, suffice to say here that this is again a full living, how to live system. It's a lifestyle system that incorporates the mind, the body, the senses, and the soul, and how they are in interaction with our, our environment and with our seasons. Now, fast forward just a little bit here, and we get into where some of the first writings from a Western perspective started to happen. And Hippocrates, not only did he say we should use our food as our medicine, but I loved this quote that I found um, from a 2003 article. And he said, whoever, or he wrote, whoever would study medicine aright must learn of the following subjects. First, he must consider the effect of each of the seasons of the year and the differences between them. Secondly, he must study the warm and the cold winds, both those which are common to every country and those peculiar to a particular locality. He was basically saying we need to live seasonally and we need to look at our health from a seasonal and a locality perspective as well as our disease processes. So again, it goes back to looking at that whole culture of living. If we look at some of the Native American cultures, uh, Hispanic cultures, we can see that they had their own traditions. For example, the three sisters, which if you garden, you've probably heard of or at least done yourself where each of these three different plants contribute something to the full system and they grow in synergy with each other. So to me, this is very similar to how we 
interact with our environment, that we take from some and we give to others, and it's really only going to work appropriately when we are doing the right things within the right seasons, within the right environment. So we've talked a little bit about two uh, more ancient cultural uh, 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 practices and systems. We've talked a little bit about Hippocrates and when he started to write about medicine. And then I wanted to give you a little glimpse into our cultural system. And I'm sure some of you are definitely, I hope all of you are rolling your eyes right now because we don't have a system. This is our system. And it's no, um, no surprise that we have such an epidemic of obesity and chronic disease process in Western society because if this is our system, there is a very little bit of quality of nutrients. They lack the quantity of nutrients that our bodies need. There's this homogeneity of ingredients. If you look at the top right picture here, uh, you can see that there's just a handful of companies that create all of our processed foods. And most likely a lot of the sourcing they do for the ingredients comes from the same locations as well. And so the only differing factor between a lot of these foods is the type of additives, the type of preservatives, the color of artificial colors, and and the flavorings that are added as well as what form they're cooked into. Bottom left, you can see uh, from a study that looked at uh, over 157,000 households between the years of 2000 and 2012, and um, they asked everybody to log uh, or to send in all of the information on all of the food they bought over a certain time period. They analyzed the data and they saw that in a majority of households that they did uh, review, that over 60%, 62% in fact, of their dietary uh, caloric energy intake was coming from these processed foods, which again are coming from this handful of companies in the upper right-hand corner. So when we look at that, it just really, I think, hits home on the lack of diversity, the lack of quality, and then the lack of seasonality that we are eating uh, in our cultural system of health or obviously disease. So my question as I looked at this is, is there hope? I mean, if, if this is where we've been, how we've been trained to eat and what we think eating is like in a Western society nowadays, how do we get back to to what I feel and believe is this beautiful system of eating and living, which is in relationship with the seasons and with the environment. Is there a map? Is there a book? Is there some way that we can get back to there? And the more I looked into that, the more I realized that, yes, actually there is this wonderful map, and it's located in every single one of us at virtually every, within virtually every cell of our bodies. So it goes back to what I was saying initially is we haven't lost it. We just don't remember it in many cases. And if we can educate ourselves and others in remembering it, it becomes our nature. It is our birthright to be well, in my opinion. It is our history and it can be our future if we choose to make it so. From a uh, naturopathic perspective, uh, we have different tenets that we believe in, and one of them is called the healing power of nature, the vis medicatrix naturae. And this is our the belief that there's an inherent self-healing process that resides in each and every one of us, and it's ordered and intelligent. And to me, this speaks to what we're going to look at more here, which is that inherent self-healing process, but also this self regulating process that's in tune with nature. And so if we look at what that actually is, and we look at it from a scientific perspective now, rather than an intuitive perspective, we actually see that there is information showing that this inherent ability to live within the seasons, um, receive the message of nature, and then to actually utilize it from a genetic perspective is again, like I said, within each and every one of our cells and our bodies. There is a host of genes called the clock genes. And these clock genes are regulated by a master gene uh, located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, this location is part of the hypothalamus and 
interesting enough, I, like I said, I think there's so many more areas that we can go into. It's just we didn't have the time uh, today, but hopefully we'll get into it more in other uh, places, is that this suprachiasmatic nucleus um, is right above the optic chiasm. So if we start to think about our eyes and light coming into our eyes, affecting this SCN, which then sends information to many other nuclei and the pineal gland uh, within, our within our brains. And this goes on to then modulate body temperature as well as the production of hormones and also sends signals to virtually all the other clock genes within our body. So you can see here that the light coming in through our eyes, um, having an effect on the SCN, that then has an effect on virtually every other cell through the messages that are sent out um, based on the amount of light that the body is receiving. So this would be something that we think about when we think about the diurnal, um, uh, or the diurnal and the circadian rhythm as well as our circannual rhythm, which is the uh, change of seasons annually or the change in our environment on an annual basis. We're going to talk a little bit more about epigenetics, but right now, if we can think about the light being one of those pieces that modulates our genes, it doesn't change our genes, but it speaks a different message to our genes. Light does that, temperature does that, and our food does that. So over the next few slides, we're going to talk um, about some of the processes that happen in living systems uh, where the light to the temperature and our food signals changes the expression of our genes at a genetic level and why living seasonally is so important to expressing the appropriate types of genes and the genes that are needed within each season. We do know that when these particular clock genes are disrupted, um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, that our health suffers. So we see sleep disorders, we see delayed sleep onset, we also see plenty of mood disorders that are associated with um, this disruption of the circadian rhythm, and this includes mania, bipolar, and depression, which many of you have probably heard of. There's the seasonal affective disorder, which is um, seasonal depression, and then we have changing in vitamin D levels. People who really hit hard on this are our shift workers, so people who are, are not sleeping um, at night and instead are awake at night and sleeping during the day. And then the rest of us who sit inside a lot, we have sedentary desk jobs or we're not outside as much as we would want to be. Uh, this has All of this has an effect on that SDN and the clock genes that are downstream from that. But it's not just these mood disorders that we just talked about or the immune system with the vitamin D, but so many other factors could be impacted by a dysregulation of the clock genes. Uh, what we do know is that, um, I want to just take a quick step back here, is our genes we talked about are, are being modulated and modified in terms of their expression through sunlight, but there's many other areas that can have an impact on that. In this particular study uh, with mice, they changed out the clock genes uh, that they were studying um, to make them homozygous for mutant mice or uh, homozygous for clock mutant mice. And what they found is that these mice who then did not have the regulation associated with an appropriately timed clock gene uh, ate much more. So they were constantly hungry, constantly looking for food and very quickly became obese. They developed metabolic syndrome with hyperleptinemia, uh, hyperlipidemia, fatty liver, high blood sugars, and lowered insulin levels. Uh, so we can see here, if we extrapolate that information to many of our people in, in today's society who are not being allowed or, or are not getting that sunlight, that appropriate amount of sunlight, these same processes are happening, or at least part of the reason why these processes are happening. Another aspect of these clock mutant mice were that they've developed more addictions, particularly to cocaine, which they were using in this particular um, study. So we can see that the potential for dysregulation of clock genes is not just 
um, in a mood disorder, but also from a metabolic disorder, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and addiction. So there's this huge component of how our environment, our seasonal environment, may affect us if we're not being appropriately stimulated by the right amount of sunlight in each of those seasons. So we know that in humans it has a big effect, uh, but we also know, and much more research has been done, on the effect of seasonal patterns in animals and as well as in plants. And so I wanted to take you through a couple of examples that I found in the literature that, again, just highlights to me the importance of seasonal relationships between animals and plants and humans and their natural environment. So today we're going to talk briefly about this really cool animal. I had never really... I actually never knew anything about the Arctic ground squirrel until I found a couple studies and learned a little bit more about it. But the Arctic ground squirrel goes into hibernation uh, when its master clock, because it has a master clock gene too, is turned off. And its master clock gene is turned off in response, of course, to the amount of sunlight that it's receiving. When it is turned off because there's fewer daylight hours and more nighttime or dark hours, the ground squirrel goes into this hibernation that can last seven to eight months per year. And, you know, it makes perfect sense that they would need to hibernate during that time period because the Arctic is covered in snow and there's very few resources and it's very cold outside. But as soon as the sunlight starts to come back and there is more sunlight and the days are elongated, this master clock is turned back on again in response to the sunlight and it wakes them up and they come out of hibernation. So complete side note here, but I thought was so cool, is these little guys, um, actually their temperatures drop down to below freezing and it's during their hibernation period. It's the uh, lowest body temperature that's ever been measured in a mammal um, without obviously them um, dying. Uh, but every two to three weeks, their, their body temperature drops to a particular level that stimulates them to start shivering. And they start to shiver for between 12 and 15 hours, which raises their body temperature back up to 98 degrees. You stop shivering for a couple of weeks, body temperature slowly comes back down to below freezing, and they start the shivering process again for seven to eight months. So again, it's just this natural uh, relationship between what is being a, what is available to us in our environment and how the body responds through these environmental stimuli. Now, in plants, there's also these clock genes. So, in, in um, you know, we ask ourselves, why do daffodils bloom in the spring, and why do carrots get their flowering tops at certain times of the year and not at a certain time of the year? So, researchers at the Plant and Developmental Genetics Laboratory at Trinity College in Dublin, uh, they worked alongside scientists throughout the world, and together they ended up discovering this gene called the Apatella-1 gene, which they dubbed the master gene in plants. And the Apatella-1 gene is turned on, of course, as we've been learning, in response to environmental cues. Once it's turned on, it's, it's as though it's acting like our clock gene, our master clock gene, and it turns on over a thousand other genes throughout the plants. Some of them are then, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't turn them on. It sends signals to over a thousand other genes within the plant. Some of these signals then quiet certain genes, and this, can uh, this would cause leaf formation to occur. And in other cases, it might uh, increase the expression of other genes, which then, again, in turn, increases the expression of particular proteins, and then you have a flowering plant. So the environmental cues that the plants respond to are very obviously similar to what we respond to, but they actually have a very uh, prominent change when they respond. And they respond to the temperature, the nutrients in the soil, the sunlight, and the length of the day. So again, it's very similar, and they don't just respond with sprouting when they have longer daylight hours. There's a whole host of the entire life cycle of a plant that is tied intricately into the sun, the seasons, the temperature, the nutrients in the soil, and as we're going to get to here, that's obviously what we're eating. And so to understand if these plants are healthy or not and in their right seasons is very important to us from our health perspective. It's important to us because the 
foods we eat are turning our genes on or off. And in response to that, we make certain proteins or don't make certain proteins. Plants and animals are the very same in terms of how they work. So although I know it's not the topic of our conversation today, I did want to bring in this particular uh, article um, and study that I found because I thought it was, it was important as practitioners when we talk to our clients about eating seasonally, eating locally, eating organically. And again, we, we kind of know why we should be recommending this, but I think this really gets to an even deeper level of understanding um, from the very genetics of why this is so important for our health. So if we look at external influences on plant genetics and then their subsequent function, we get to this plant called the Aridopsis thalamia, and I probably butchered that name, but it's right there for you if you want to look it up. And this is a uh, roadside weed, they called it, but obviously it's part of the Brassicaceae family. You can see its flower is very much a cruciferous flower and um, the seed pods as well. And they use this quite a bit in genetic research um, because they understand the genetic, the genome of this plant and they know how to uh, change it, modify it, and see what happens. A 2014 study that I was looking at demonstrated that herbicides and the herbicide pollutants, when um, this plant was exposed to those, actually caused the plant to flower early. And the, the way it created this uh, to happen was the herbicide worked on a, what's called a photoperiod pathway. So it actually changed some of the clock genes within the plant that then uh, caused a signal to go to the Apatella 1 gene that we just talked about and led to a earlier flowering time. So potentially from an agricultural perspective, maybe this might be important. I don't know enough about big agriculture to say whether it is or not. But from a just a perspective of thinking about the natural cycles, this doesn't sound like it's a good idea to me in so many ways. One of the ways is what happens to our pollinators when they go to pollinate and the flowers have already flowered and they're gone now. Or what happens to the flowers who need the pollinators but they've flowered too early so the pollinators aren't there yet. So this is obviously one plant, one experiment, but if we think about this from a much broader and global perspective where many, many, many of our food sources are now being inundated with herbicides and herbicide pollutants, as well, as well as just the wild foliage in general, we are really shifting um, shifting things and I don't think that we really understand what's happening yet or what the potential outcomes are for this. But what I want to look at here with this particular study, and again bring it back to what the topic of our webinar is today, is if we're changing the genetic expression of plants because of the herbicides we use, how does that affect us? as humans when we eat those plants based on the seasonality of when their genes were on and off and if those on and off genes were not being appropriately timed, what kind of effect might it have on us or what kind of effect might it have on the actual constituents of the plants when we're eating them. When we look at other items that we're eating on a a typical basis in most of our Western culture. We're looking at beef and we're looking at milk as well. And these are foods that also have a seasonality to them in terms of how much um, omega-3s and how much omega-6s might be in either the meat or the actual milk. And if we're eating some of these foods when the animals themselves were not exposed to their se uh, appropriate and natural seasonal shift, it has changed the quality, the quantity, and what's actually available through those foods. And again, we are then eating those. There's a couple of the other studies I wanted to jump into here so that we can again start to bring this back in terms of understanding why seasonal eating is important, but even more so why well, I shouldn't say that's more so, but also just as importantly, why those plants should be grown in their appropriate season. So I'm going to first start out with a basal study. Uh, we all love basil and, you know, we use it typically in the summertime. 
a 2007 study that tested the biological properties of the basal plant found that both the antioxidant and the antimicrobial activities of their essential oils varied significantly depending on the season of the year that they harvested the plant. So again, this gives us some insight into might there be appropriate times when we want an antimicrobial uh, component of a particular herb or a particular plant. And if we don't grow it or harvest it or eat it at the appropriate time, we will actually not be receiving the benefits or at least the optimal benefits that that plant could produce for us if it was grown and eaten in its appropriate season. Another study that aimed to determine the variability of vitamin C levels in broccoli uh, found that it also depended on the season it was grown. They found that the fall or the autumn values for vitamin C were nearly twice as high as those that were found in the broccoli plant, plant in the spring. And this held true whether they were looking at conventional or organically grown forms of broccoli. Again, just bringing this back to, we might say broccoli is a great food and everybody should be eating broccoli for the most part. And we say, eat it all year round, right? Are we really distinguishing when we should be eating broccoli versus when we should be eating another plant that might be typically higher in vitamin C at a different time of the year? So now we're gonna look at how this information that's coming from the plant and if it's the appropriate information and that those plants have been grown appropriately in the right season, in the right environment, how they speak to our genes. So we've looked at epigenetics and epigenetics is the broader study of how our environment affects us and influences our genetic expression. But food is, is such, a, um, such an intimate part of our everyday life that it has such a tremendous value and it's such a powerful tool, as Dr. Mark Hyman notes here, to change our health. The phytochemicals that are in plants, these are the plant chemicals, they do speak to our genes. And this is all now a more focused area of epigenetics and this is called nutrigenomics. And it's how our food modifies or supports the different expression of our genes. It's, it's very important to note that uh, nutrigenomics and epigenetics do not change our genetics. So we have our A's and our C's and our D's, I'm sorry, our A's and our C's and our T's and our G's that create the different proteins in our body and our DNA in our body, but, and, and our environment doesn't change what we have in our DNA. What it does is it turns genes on or off or it turns them down or it turns them up. So it basically regulates the expression of our genetics. In this particular study, uh, we can see that the phytonutrients that we were talking about on the previous page, which are the, the plant chemicals, they do have particular powerful, um, they are particular powerful modifiers of the genetic expression. And here we're looking at it can be so powerful that it can actually support modification of certain cancer pathways. Again, I think we can have a powerful food. Let's say it's the broccoli we talked about, or it's the EGCG and green tea, or it's the curcumin, whatever it might be. And that food can be very powerful, but it's even more powerful and potent when it's in its right seasonality, and we use it according to the cycles of the year. We can see the antioxidants in general are very um, powerful in our prevention and treatment of a variety of different chronic diseases. If you look on the right-hand side, I kind of pulled out some of the aspects of this abstract that I thought were pretty important here, and you can read through those anytime. But really here is the uh, fourth bullet point, which we're looking at the antioxidants the free radical scavenging abilities and the anti-inflammatory actions of these phytochemicals which can be found in fruits and vegetables. And these phytochemicals are what helps us in our anti-cancer components and anti-aging and they're protective for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, neurodegenerative disorders. So these antioxidants, these chemicals, these phytochemicals and constituents that we can find in the fruits and vegetables, again, are extremely powerful but my thought is that, and we're seeing in the literature, is that it can be even more powerful 
and, and more protective and more therapeutic when they're utilized in the right timing. If we look at um, what's called curcubitacin, this is a particular phytochemical or, or um, uh, chemical in the curcubitaceae family of plants, and of course that would be our cucumbers as well as our squash and our gourds. Uh, they found that um, the higher the content, or excuse me, the higher the temperature, the higher the content of this particular uh, constituent. When I was reading through the study, it didn't make sense to me at first because they said that there was a higher component of the cucurbitacin in uh, the January time frame and a lower in the June. But then when I looked a little bit closer, I realized that this was a study done in India and the temperatures were actually, when they looked at the different temperatures and the different um, months of the year, the temperatures were higher in January and they were lower in June and thus that is why there was a higher amount of this chemical or constituent in the January months that they found here. If we think about in the Western in, in Western uh, practices here, we find that the cucumber um, that we grow typically has its seasonality in the summer and uh, early fall time frame. And that's when we're going to find its best qualities and its most optimal nutrition or nutrients. And so that's why we should be eating cucumbers for us here anyway in those months versus maybe in December when there's snow outside and there's not as high of this particular constituent, which we find is very helpful for a variety of different health aspects. Um, you can see here in the third bullet point, it's liver protective, it's anti-inflammatory, it's a cytotoxic agent, antimicrobial properties, um, et cetera. So again, I'm hoping that this brings information together in, in your mind to see why seasonality is so important and there's a variety of reasons for it and that the plant itself needs to be grown in its particular optimal environment and season in order to express its best genes that will then feed us. Now in humans we know that there's also a cyclical and a seasonal um, aspect to different disease processes. Asthma we often see most frequently in the springtime bipolar, depression, cardiovascular disease, hypothyroidism, a majority of these are most often seen in um, higher prevalence during the winter and the cold months. So when we think about how we might utilize this information in our practices or within our families and for ourselves, there's some different things we should consider. And so I wanted to take you a little bit through my thought process and how I organize um, my therapeutics around the seasons and the time of the year for each of my individual patients. Uh, it, it, this is somewhat just, you know, coming from my brain. I haven't sat down and, and thought through this for, for days and weeks and months. But as I was creating this slide, I realized there's a process that I do go through. And so you'll create your own process, whether again it's for yourself, your family, or your clients, uh, to understand how to bring this information both from the traditional perspectives of our ancient cultures as well as the newer information that we're receiving out of the literature now. So first and foremost, I want to look at what is the disease process that they are presenting with and where are they within that particular disease process now. But I also want to know who they are from a um, individual perspective. What is their true constitution. Who are they really without the disease process? And of course this, this brings in a lot of questioning, but it also brings in a lot of listening to your client of how they're describing their life and who they used to be before they became sick. What their favorite activities used to be versus what they are now. Um, their energetics. What is, who are they? Who is sitting in front of you? How do you describe them? How do you feel them? That's kind of the way I come at it. Again, it's a very um, non-tangible um, method, I think, but it, it also becomes uh, more of that art of learning your, your, your clients and learning what you can do to support them through these energetics. Then I want to know what's normal versus abnormal within their disease process. Um, we'll probably, we, I, we, we didn't talk about, but we will in a moment here, how hypothyroidism does become more prominent in terms of its symptomatology during the winter. 
So what I want to find out if they're coming in with hypothyroidism and it's worse in the winter is how worse is it? Is it something that we can modify through a lifestyle aspect without changing their medication? Or is it so bad at this point that we absolutely need to bring in a prescription to at least get them back into a functioning um, body again so that then we can implement some of these lifestyle changes. So what's normal, what's abnormal, and then what needs to be treated and what can be modified? And then I want to start thinking about the seasonality of their therapeutics. Are they coming in in the winter or are they coming in in the summer? What items do I need to start considering in terms of their nutrition and in terms of their lifestyle for the therapeutic approach? And this goes into the energy of the nutrition. And then I want to know, once I come up with a plan and we've talked about it, what's the feasibility of them actually putting that into, um, into play? So we're going to go through two um, quick scenarios in terms of disease processes and how we might approach it in terms of looking at it from a seasonality um, and a cyclical perspective uh, through nutrition and lifestyle. The first is cardiovascular disease, so we're going to look at hypertension, because hypertension, we can, if you think about hypertension, to me anyway, I think about constriction, and I think about heating and being hot and inflamed, and that there's, there's this vascular um, constrictiveness and congestion within the whole cardiovascular system. Again, that's my energetic vision and, and feeling for it. You'll have your own. Hypertension then, when I think about foods, is I want to think about cooling foods. I want to think about foods that are going to expand and open and increase circulation and increase flexibility of the vasculature walls. So when I look at lists of food, let's say I'm looking at a particular nutrition that I want to recommend for this patient, and it's potassium. What I've done here is pulled up two charts. It's actually one chart, uh, but it wouldn't all fit on the screen from World's Healthiest Foods, and if you haven't been to the, his website or, or looked through this book, it's a, definitely a must. Um, this is a list of high potassium natural whole foods. And so what I do for this particular patient is if this patient came in and let's say we were in the summer, I'd want to pick out foods that were cooling, expanding, opening, um, increasing flexibility from a potassium perspective that are in season in the summer. And as you go through the list, you might find if you live in Australia that it's going to be a completely different set of foods in the summer than it would be in our summer here in the United States. And so again, that's that individuality of therapeutics as well as bringing in the seasonal aspects and then the energetic component of the hypertension aspect. So you go through this list, you pick out some of the foods that would be best and most appropriate for that season, you'd make up your food chart, and then you'd see them again in the fall or you'd see them again in the winter, and you'd probably modify that food uh, choice. What you're doing is not only are you um, making recommendations for the actual disease process of hypertension, but you're also supporting that client and patient in remembering what seasonality feels and looks like and how it's implemented into everyday life. Here's another couple charts, and this is for uh, magnesium. So again, if I had a hypertensive patient coming in, uh, we wanted to add in more magnesium foods. I'm not just going to throw out the first top five. I'm going to look at it from a seasonal perspective. What's in season that's high in magnesium? <clears throat> and those would be the foods that I would utilize to support from the magnesium perspective. I'd also look at the seasonality of the meats that they might be eating or the animal proteins that they're eating, the fiber content that I'm adding in, the different omegas uh, that I might recommend and based on which foods are in season during that time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hypothyroidism, on the other hand, I'm kind of taking through, through two different extremes. We've got our hypertension, which is very constricting, hot and inflammatory, and then we've got our hypothyroidism, Again, in my, my internal visualization of hypothyroidism and what I've seen in my clinic most often is um, this is the more sluggish, tired, depressed, cold sensitive, foggy brain, fatigued, low energy, weight gain type of 
constitution, although it's their disease constitution and not their real constitution. And so then my, my um, goal here is to understand what's normal for them and what's abnormal because we have a lot of people who in their normal constitution are more sedentary in nature versus somebody who is more anxious and jittery and jumpy. And so you have to learn their constitution. How much do we want to treat and how much do we modify, mod, want to modify? But again, we want to get them to a place where they're actually feeling extremely well. No matter what that final place is, it's, it's a matter of where their needs are. So is it normal or is it abnormal? Do we treat with increased prescription or can we use um, uh, lifestyle medicine and nutrition uh, from a seasonal perspective. Also remembering, here's uh, this great slide showing that our T3 production, which is our active hormone from the thyroid and, and pretty much um, talks to all of our cells from a metabolic perspective, um, does change in terms of seasonality as well. You can see in the top there, it's summertime we have a lot higher um, T3 production versus in the winter time it does go down and it makes sense then that we do need to kind of bring our energy inward, slow down, do a little bit more sleeping, nourish our bodies with warming foods. So this is our hypothyroid patient. We're not going to give them, even though we know that whole foods and plants fruits and vegetables are healthy for them from an anti-inflammatory perspective, we're not going to give them cold raw food because they're already cold and now it's winter on top of it. So we want to give them those nourishing, warming foods that have been cooked so that they can bring in the nutrients and assimilate them um, as easily as possible. We don't want their system to overwork itself. Those stews and soups and root vegetables, again, this is a hypothyroid patient in winter. So this would be the approach that I would have here. I want warm drinks. I want to uh, reduce the stimulation on their adrenal glands to reduce their stress, which again is really in sync with winter when we're lowering our energy. We don't want that stress coming on. If I'm looking from, for botanicals, I'm thinking warming, circulating, nourishing, and calming. Again, these are just words, but they mean something once you understand the energetics of different plants and different foods and then the energetics of people. You start to bring it all together and then within that seasonality. And then when I'm looking for specific nutrients, I might do the very same thing that we looked at for hypertension where I look at a list of iodine-rich foods, iron-rich foods, and then I pull out the ones that are most appropriate for that season and that particular person. Lifestyle from a hypothyroid perspective, again, looking at a seasonal consideration, it's okay to move inwards, and we need to talk about that uh, with our clients, that fall and winter months are the time to bring the energy down, be a little bit more quiet, not be so active, sleep a little bit more, the sun's not out as long, so we should be following the cycles of the sun as much as we can within the parameters of our daily lives. I mean, we have work, we have kids, we have families, we have these um, uh, obligations that we're committed to. Exercise, we don't necessarily need to have them running a marathon in the middle of the winter where it's cold outside, but instead we need to have them still moving, but moving in a fashion that's not as intense, but still supporting their internal circulation. Uh, contrast hydrotherapy has been helpful for some patients and then just keeping that area of the neck covered and keeping it warm. Light ther therapy can be very helpful, especially if the, uh, the low daylight hours is very pro uh, problematic for, for a particular individual. And then of course checking labs um, as needed to make sure that we're not missing anything. A low vitamin D is a low vitamin D. It's going to have an impact. And so if we need supplementation, we absolutely need to get that into there. So that's going to kind of wrap it up for the, the research and, and the different aspects of seasonal eating and living. And I wanted to just give you some summaries and takeaway, a summary and takeaways to hopefully bring it together, uh, like I said, into a comprehensive understanding of why seasonal living and eating is so very important for us. So what we've learned here is that what we eat and in the environment in which we live does provide information to our genes and that these genes then direct the protein production and the subsequent function of our cells and our organ systems. What we eat does contain nutrients which will vary seasonally just like the amount of sunlight and both of these are signals to our genes and those signals will vary depending on the season of which the food was grown as well as the amount of sunlight that we have coming into our bodies. 
It also will vary on the microbes in the soil, the nutrients that are available, etc. Plants and animals respond to their environment. This influences their genes, which influences the quality of the plant and the animal, and it's no different in us. When the quality of our health, our, the quality of our health does respond as well to the quality of the plants and animals that we consume and the activities and lifestyle that we undertake in each season. So eating locally and seasonally and living seasonally in general will optimize the messages that are sent to our genes and thus our health and our well-being. And then using this approach can, uh, to treatment can support optimal healing in our patients and in ourselves and in our families. So as the saying goes, to everything there is a season, and hopefully this, the information in this webinar has um, solidified that uh, information. So thank you, and I guess we'll look at some questions if we have time. Uh, we do have time, and yeah, just, again, a beautiful presentation, Bianca. Is, um, I, I learned a lot here. It's, I, I've, my, my mind's kind of spinning. I have, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> So good. Um, I'm I'm ready. We've got some few comments and questions um, um, that's been posted from attendees. I'm encouraging you, if you have them now, to get them in so that we have time and you're queued up and you don't get missed. But but a couple things come to mind, Bianca, and that is um, just thinking back on seasonal eating and and how it's changed in in Western culture. That it it was simply a way of life. It wasn't something that that somebody thought, oh, I need to eat seasonally. We're, we talk about that now because right. we've deviated so much, right? But there weren't any other resources. There wasn't any worldwide food distribution. There weren't any, you know, GMOs um, supposedly designed to feed the whole world. There, there wasn't any takeout. There, there was no ready-made and, and packaged food available. It's like you said, the way that you ate when you raised on your farm, you, you, you preserved what you had and reached out to your local community and exchanged and, and shared with others when they had too much zucchini and <laughs> were begging you to take it. <laughs> you had too many tomatoes and, and it was a really lovely exchange. But it's, um, it, was, it was just natural. It was, there was no other way to be, right? Exactly. It, it was just the way people lived. Yeah. So I, I, I really appreciated you showing um, your, your family's pantry, your uncles and your mothers. It was delightful to see their pictures and just beautiful to see what was still there in spring after the winter's um, enjoyment of it. And, um, and, and then how, you know, you're, you're working within your own family construct and the foods that you're bringing in. But I noticed that you didn't show your pantry, <laughs> and I wonder how yeah. different it is now from your mother's, given the busy lifestyle that you have. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but it's just no. You know, it, I'm glad you asked about that because you know it's actually something that um, pulls at me. It, it it bothers me, and and it's been an aspect of our lives, my husband and mine now, for the last few years to figure out how do we get back into this so right we can have this wonderful information but then it's about how do we implement it how do we actually do it so we do our jams we do applesauce and we do what we can with zucchini we've got freezer we do a lot of freezer stuff and that has been a little bit easier for me to um, keep some of our produce from the summer mm -hmm. but it's nothing like the way I grew up it would it, I would love to be back at that place but it takes a lot of time yes. and so that's that balance too how do we you know do how much can we do in the constraints of and not even the constraints but maybe even the desire to live the way we live now versus um, what can't we do and can we source that from our local farmers market where do we live I live in Northern California I can get fresh produce almost year-round from our farmers market but how about if I lived back in Iowa? No way. Right. So, you know, no, my pantry looks nothing like that. And you're right, I didn't take a picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the seasonal pieces, we do grow our garden, and that's, but it has to be much bigger, and it has to be much more if I'm going to be happy with it because it's not where I want it to be. And, mm -hmm. and there's so much more to do, and it's a matter of the timing. Yes, yeah, sure.
And, and it may be that, you know, back on the farm that there was a, bit, a different family construct, that maybe there was more elders in a broader family community that was, was contributing to what was grown and, and what was canned and what was put up in, in, in such a way, and not just you as a naturopathic doctor and, and mother and teacher and everything else that you've got going on to try to juggle all of those things. Absolutely right. Yep, we, we did have a, a, a larger family um, uh, tree that, that lived together and we all did put in work for sure. So one of the questions is if we eat the same foods, even if they're whole foods all year, how does that affect the genes? If someone's eating plant-based diet, um, supplementing with really healthy um, eggs, meats, and fish, is, et cetera, as healthy as it can be, but it's the same, what do you think the effect is there? So we, I, I haven't found any literature to support my thought process on this one um, in whole. I've just found pieces here and there, and I tried to put some of those pieces into the webinar. But I really believe that the more that we can eat from the healthy foods that are seasonal, that the better the message will be. Mm -hmm. So to eat broccoli year-round, is it problematic? Well, I haven't come across any studies that say it's problematic to the genetic mm -hmm. expression. But my, my question is, can we optimize? Can we do better? than right. we're doing even by just eating a whole foods diet. I think it was this morning there was a, um, uh, uh, Good Morning America, I think it was this morning, had a quick blurb on the healthiest diet was the Mediterranean diet and Italians now are, the I think, the longest living um, mm -hmm. ethnic group. And uh, they said it's because of Mediterranean diet. But I'd venture to guess again that if we went into that Mediterranean diet, they're not eating the same foods year-round. Yes, they're eating anti-inflammatory foods and they're eating whole foods, but they're eating it on a seasonal basis. And I think that's what I'm really trying to get at is that there are optimal foods within each season, even though they all might be anti-inflammatory or antioxidants or hepatoprotective, mm -hmm. but that there's better foods for different seasonalities that talk to our genes in a more clear and direct message than if we were to put all of it in throughout the year. Yeah, and I just wanted to make a point about Mediterranean diet that that's kind of um, makes me think is that it, it's not just one diet. Um, it varies from the north to the south to the different parts of, of Italy and that changes the weather, that changes the amount of light there is, that changes the amount of temperature ranges and so the, the foods and, and the diet is slightly different. Um, well, it's not just one diet to me. <laughs> right, and, and it does have its variabilities, yes. I also liked um, you bringing in the, the um, traditional Chinese medicine and the Ayurvedic perspectives and, and contrasting how very different the modern Western approach is and, and that it's not a system. We, we have really lost the way. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's a system of, of disease management that doesn't really include real foods or, or the consideration that food has any, um, that, that matters at all, really. It's, it's, right. it, it's sad how far we've deviated. It, they um, become ingredients versus nutrients and versus messages, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me get to this next question. Um, so this comes back to the clock genes that are regulated by a master gene. And and I, I, I have to ask myself, does it vary with the amount of light that the eyes receive. You talked a little bit about what if we're inside all the time, day and night? What if we're relying primarily on, on artificial light? And just the amount of device views that are happening on an ongoing basis all day long from from you know having traveled just the way that I did, you know, I, I saw infants on iPads. Um, oh, and goodness. everybody else <laughs> walking around staring at them as they were going through airports, etc. So I, I just, even though there's a change in the season, there might not be affecting them in the same way if they're not, if we're not outside in it. Wow, that's a, absolutely. I agree with you on being outside to receive the actual sunlight itself. But I hadn't even at this point within this webinar considered the effects that are our devices are having 
on those clock chains and that would be a really interesting avenue to explore in terms of do are we modifying the expression and the um, of the actual clock chains themselves in, right. and, and are we pushing some of those disease processes that we talked about that can happen when the clock chains are disrupted Mm-hmm. So yeah, there, there's another aspect to consider. It's it's huge in my mind. Uh, the avenues yeah. to consider. Yeah, like I said, you know, I'm I'm spinning with here too, and just delighted with the presentation because it brings up the next question of, you know, I wonder how the gene clocks are changing with climate change. You know, with the ice caps melting, with the, the change in in migration to a variety of animals, and the the plants that are emerging or disappearing as a consequence in various locations. You so know, I, is, I I told my uh, husband a couple. I showed him a couple of the studies as I was putting this together, and you know, his jaw just dropped because he's although he he hears it from me and and he gets it, he di- he didn't realize the depth of what was happening and what can happen and how closely tied we are to nature. Um, and so, you know, I think us as a Hawthorne community and our listeners and our clients, we do understand it, but how about the rest of society? Do we really understand what's happening with all of these new changes and when we've forgotten to listen to nature and yes, to what so. those messages are? Exactly. And so while this is strong and very emerging research, I think it's going to keep emerging as we see these changes having you know, potent effects on us as humans and animals and plants. Mm-hmm. And you know, the thing that I was um, really struck with in terms of uh, the, the mouse study where they um, had the homozygous clock chain mice um, was that maybe our obesity and chronic disease illness cannot just be, I mean, obviously it's a tremendous part, but maybe there's more to it than just, just not just eating whole foods and eating only processed foods. Is it that we're also not receiving messages from the seasonal components of those plants when we don't eat them? Exactly. And does that also affect the genetic expression that then increases the risk of those cardiovascular disease? components and diabetes and addictions and you know so maybe it's maybe it's food but maybe it's food from a much deeper perspective than we really understand maybe it's because we're not getting the sunlight but maybe it's because the plants are also not receiving what they need from their seasonal perspective yeah and that begs another question that I have and and Randy does too she says what if we live in an area that doesn't have real seasons like Southern California should we still eat seasonally um, because I, I I think that it's um, helpful properties change with temperatures, right? Is what you're bringing up, and it's it, it, it's interesting for plants and climates that grow year round. I mean, I just came mm-hmm. out of the tropics, and so didn't I mean I wasn't there for multiple seasons, but it just seemed like that was their that was their diet, and it was hot, and and that didn't vary very much. Right. You know, when I, I definitely, Southern California, I, I lived down there for, for a few years, and one of my complaints was, there's no seasons, nothing changes, it's just the mm-hmm. same all year round. But there are micro fluctuations. Now, I'm definitely not an expert on Southern California temperature changes and, and the seasonality of Southern California, or anywhere else for that matter, but I would suspect that there might be enough variation that certain plants, if we were actually growing our own plants and living in um, uh, traditional ways that yes. there would be plants that would grow better at certain times of those years even though there wasn't a huge fluctuation. That would just be my guess but I, I don't know the answer to that question mm-hmm. and so I think again it would be based on where you're living and like we saw in that study where there's a seasonality to the genes that are expressed there there's probably certain genes that are turned on higher than others depending on where you live versus just summer and winter genes. There's yeah, probably sure. some modification of those as well. And, and there's still, you know, you, you see the fruit, I mean the, the oranges come out and still they, they fruit once a year, you know, they're they're not year yeah. round. So there are changes mm-hmm. and you know coming, growing up in the Midwest and moving to Northern California I used to think there were no seasons here. 
um, <laughs> by comparison. You know, there was very stark right. four seasons there, and and it's like, oh, it's just always green, and but it's not. You talk about the micro fluctuations, and and it, it took me a while to really adapt to to recognize how significant our changes are too um, in, in weather and light and, and the plants that, that come and grow and leaf growth that comes and falls and so I look at that and, and, and also just in our western culture as we move from place to place we tend to take our plates, our plants with us and we want those mm -hmm. plants in our landscape, we want those plants in our garden and it's, it, it, it begs us to come back to what's native. Um, there's a lot of work around native plant um, here in Northern California, especially around the, the coastal ranges and eradicating what's identified as a non-native plant. And, and I've asked us, like, how far do you have to go back to identify it as non-native? If something's been right. here for 400 years, is it native? Um, right. Yeah. Does it thrive? Don't have any questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but, but, you know, so many cultures will, 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 will always travel. If they're relocating, they'll take a plant with them. They, and, and often a chicken, <laughs> right? You know, they've right. got to have the, the essential <laughs> things with them to um, to feel at home and, and and to get started again. So, yeah, good questions are coming up here. I appreciate it a lot. I, I mean, it comes up for me. This is the first year that I know it in my life that I haven't planted my garlic crop, and 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 gotten it in in November or December. And I'm kind of scratching my head and saying. Well, I know it can still grow now if I put it in. I may need to water it in a way that I didn't, wouldn't have needed to. But I have to ask, you know, will the properties be different of it growing it in spring rather than over winter? What do you think? Yeah, great question. I mean, I can <laughs> I can go back to what we learned in uh, school, which is, you know, when when botanists or herbalists, I, most likely herbalists, um, harvest their their uh, botanicals and their herbs, they utilize different timing to do so based on which constituent that they're most desiring to get for that particular from that particular plant. So if they're looking for the antioxidant properties versus the antimicrobial properties versus a particular essential oil, they will harvest each of the different sections of the plants, whether it's the root, the flower, the, the leaf, at a different time of the year or season to get the most optimal constituent from it. So, I mean, for whatever that's worth, I think there probably is optimal timing. Does it totally negate the properties? I don't think so. I, I really don't. I mean, I, you know, when we looked at those couple of studies of the broccoli and the uh, basil, they still had the properties they were looking for at each of the seasons. It was just at a higher or a lower quantity. Okay. Good thinking on that too. And the last thing here, Alex brought up um, uh, an article out of um, uh, PubMed, and it's about human hibernation. So I was thinking, reflecting on this in the squirrel topic that you brought up. And but are you familiar with this? This is a practice closely akin to hibernation. It's said to be general among Russian peasants in a certain province where food is scanty and the degree is almost equivalent to chronic famine. So they've got no provisions to carry them through the whole year. So they've adopted the um, the practice of spending one half of the year in sleep, and they have a wow. custom that's existed among them from time immemorial that at the first fall of snow, the whole family gathers around the stove, lies down, ceases to wrestle with the problems of their human existence, and quietly goes to sleep. And every day. Once a day, one person wakes up to eat a piece of hard bread, of which an amount was sufficient to last for six months, and and baked the previous autumn, and they wash it down with a draught of water, and they go to sleep again. And somebody's in charge of making sure that the fire gets started too. But this is how they live in 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 a time where there wasn't world distribution of food, and it's still ongoing. Oh my goodness, no, I have not seen that. I would love to read that. That's fascinating. I, I sent you the link, and um, you have it in, the, in your webinar chat panel, oh, but I'll also great. send it to you after here, because um, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, <laughs> like we're here, you know, we're doomed to sit here and hear each other groan and <laughs> can scarcely imagine, you know, living in Nirvana for, for six months and just being free of stress of life and Sleeping. knowing labor, <laughs> all the birds, everything of existence. They're like, we'll just go to sleep now. Is What else can we do? 
I think that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, okay. it, it just, I think, helps us to realize that we're so much more than just our physical body and cells and that we really are connected um, and, and really getting back in tune with that connection can support health and well-being. Um, I don't think it's lost. I think there's probably a lot of questions. I think a lot of them are academic questions and sometimes maybe we have to hold off on the academics and just go with our intuition and our gut feeling and other times we need the academics to really support what we're seeing and feeling and doing. Um, and, you know, like you and I said earlier, it's this waning and, and growing and it's this flux and it's just being okay with where we are in our understanding but still wanting to learn more and, um, yeah. Well, I so appreciate what you brought to the table here, um, Bianca. It's it's fantastic. I mean, we have this um, th this simple belief that eating seasonally is good for us, and you've really expanded on the reasons why very much. And um, I look forward to following it as emerging research. And and um, anything more that you can bring to it, I'll be happy to hear about over time. Well, thanks so much for having me, Paul. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So I've got some closing comments here, everybody. I want to remind you that this webinar was recorded. It'll be available on our Hawthorne website uh, under archived webinars in just a few days. Um, you'll be able to review this presentation as well as a wide variety of other topics from previous webinars. And if we've inspired you to learn more about health and nutrition, I also say that Hawthorne offers many programs and courses. And so I encourage you to visit our website for more details. And if and when you're ready for more personalized attention, Kathy McDermott's our Director of Admissions and would be like, delighted to answer any of your questions. Also, that there's a survey to fill out after the webinar ends. It's just a couple of minutes, but it helps me to have your feedback and your comments. We consider it carefully and really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you for that. And I'll invite you to join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, April 4th with traditional naturopath Glenn Depke on the topic of gut infections, which are often the source of gut, brain, and immune issues. And um, certainly he'll be talking about natural approaches that support healing. Um, so that'll be addressed as well. We'll start that webinar um, a little early for announcements as usual, so join me for that. And I think it'll be a good presentation as well to tune into. Um, Glenn also is a great presenter and brings good information to the table. And a reminder about our next All About Alumni on April 5th with doctoral graduate Vicki Stein presenting. I'll be there and excited about what she's got to share. So that concludes today's presentation, everybody. I want to thank you again, Bianca, so much. And everyone well, thank you for sharing. So much, Paula. Oh, sure. It, it, it's been terrific. It's always good to have you with us. Um, I want to thank everybody for sharing this educational experience with us, and I wish you all the best of health and learning more together at Hawthorne University's webinar and all about alumni series. and. And as I reflect on today's presentation, I think I'll just continue to practice loving kindness and compassion in all ways because what you practice grows stronger. So I hope you'll join me in this too. Thanks, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Bye for now.